And one thing that's been really interesting in my life, this is going to sound very funny, is that I've been learning a lot from reading, which is, you know, people think of as a good means of learning. Uh, I, I, I probably read a lot relative to most people normally, but in the last week I've been reading a lot, particularly a lot of books about energy and environmental issues, but, and then also some books uh, related that, that, that have turned out to be related to that. So in the last week, let's see, what have I read? I've read this book called, I think it's called Global Warming Skepticism for Busy People by Roy Spencer, who's a climate scientist, and then a book called Dumb Energy. Don, I think you've read part of that. What's, what's the author's name on that one? Do you know? Not offhand. Uh, Norman something. Someone look that up and we'll find it. I think it's, it's Norman, but it's a physicist, pretty smart guy. And then I've been reading Vaclav Smil's Energy and Civilization. I'm about, I don't know, uh, 20% of the way through that one. And then I finished this book called University of Berkshire Hathaway, which is about the, no, it's, it's about the content of the different uh, famous shareholder meetings from Berkshire Hathaway, which is the organization run by Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. So been, yeah, been reading a lot, gotten in the habit of just making my default iPhone app, the Kindle app, which ends up leading me to do a lot of extra reading. So I thought I'd just talk a little bit about these books and then some thoughts that they gave me. So the, um, the global warming skepticism for busy people book that, that title makes it sound like, oh, it's just going to be, you know, if you've read books by quote unquote global warming skeptics, then this will just be a summary. I found it to be very good. Now, Roy Spencer is generally a very good writer about climate issues, so it's not too surprising. But this one in particular, I found to be very good, particularly in that he gives he gives a very causal description of how climate works. That's one thing is just explaining things like greenhouse effect very, very clearly in a way that's easy to visualize for the most part. And also he, he exhibits a lot of the virtues I've talked about in terms of what we should want our knowledge system to give us. For example, he talks about, you know, he addresses the, uh, some strong arguments from other people against his viewpoint. And he expresses degrees of certainty and uncertainty about different things. And he gives explanations of where the evidence comes from. And these things are, are, quite unusual, unfortunately, when scientific or other technical issues are being discussed. And so I find it very refreshing. And certainly when I read such people, it gives me a lot more confidence in their views that they're willing to engage in such a way. And I thought that, okay, well, the next thing I'll read in this domain, and I'll be really curious on the methodology of that, although I have some negative expectations, is the book The Madhouse Effect by Michael Mann, who's maybe the most prominent climate scientist today, on the catastrophist side, and it'll just be really interesting to read that. So I have a, I'm partially making this resolution public uh, because I'm not always inclined to read Michael Mann because I, I find him distasteful in a number of ways. But he's, he's a, he, he can be kind of a pretty good writer, and he's a smart guy, and he certainly is a good, uh, he he definitely is a good person to read to get the catastrophist view. And I haven't, I've read shorter articles of him and seen some of his stuff, uh, you know, his different lecture performances and debate performances, but this will be an interesting comparison to Roy Spencer's book because he, um, it'll be kind of his summary of what everyone should know about the field. So stay tuned next week for a summary of that, or maybe he'll, it's possible he'll raise an, or I wouldn't even be surprised if he raises an interesting kind of point that I haven't thought about before. And then it'd be really interesting to see uh, what, I, it would be hard to get him on the phone, but I'll, I'll bet Roy Spencer would at least discuss some of those issues. So we may have, may try to get him on the program. Uh, Don, did you, did you read that book or did you read part of it? No, the only one I've started is Dumb Energy. Oh, okay. Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, so I I'd definitely recommend this book, Global Warming Skepticism for Busy People, just uh, yeah, if you want to understand that viewpoint. And one thing that's good about it 
is he's very explicit about, okay, I have a point of view. I'm not every climate scientist. I'm not even every global warming skeptic, but here's how I think about it. And I think he does a good job of explaining his view and also situating it in the context of other people's views. So that's that was a, that was a good read and has been helpful in thinking about the climate sections of the moral case for fossil fuels 2.0, and in particular, how to just give even clearer cause and effect explanations about how climate works, and then how that relates to the broader issue of what I'll often call climate livability, since we, we need to understand the climate itself, particularly the atmosphere and how that works. But then ultimately, what we're interested in is how livable is the atmosphere. And that's going to be a combination of the state of the atmosphere, but then also the state of human resources and capabilities to deal with the atmosphere, including to take a given type of atmosphere and make it much more livable. So I, I'll sometimes use the example of if you have a, a, a tough thunderstorm going on 300 years ago, that atmospheric situation could have threatened your life and now it can be a romantic setting for a couple to have dinner because they're so protected from it because of their resources and capabilities. So definitely uh, check that out if you're looking for something good to read. Now, this book, Dumb Energy, this, I like this. I, I don't recommend it as consistently as I recommend the Spencer book, but it actually, but I, I do recommend a lot of it. And it actually probably, led to or helped more of my own thinking than the, the Spencer book did, although that has helped it a lot too. And so I'll talk about some of the points that come up in dumb energy, but I'll, I'll, it's going to be mixed with my own points. So don't exactly attribute this to the author, but, um, but I'll, I'll try to indicate where I felt like I got some particular insight. By the way, can, have either of you found out yet what the author's name is? Yeah, I have it right here. Hold on. So this guy's I know he is yeah, say it whenever you find Norman it. uh Norman Rogers. Norman Rogers. Got it. Sorry. Uh I think it's Dr. Rogers or uh Mr. Rogers for forgetting uh your name, but hopefully we'll get some good publicity to the book. So my understanding is this guy's a physicist, but he seems to, he knows a lot about the grid. Like a lot about the grid, way more than I do. And so that I really like it when I read about the electric grid and it's from people who have either a lot of direct experience from it or this guy, he just might have the mind that has just studied it really, really well. So the thing about the book that I don't find that, that I think is somewhat problematic, particularly as something that you would want to share with other people, is that it's not, it does not do a great job of starting with the audience's context and really carefully taking them from where they are to where he thinks they need to be. It's more like it, it, it says, a, it, it does a lot of, it makes a lot of powerful declarative statements early in the book. Now, a lot of those end up being substantiated, but a lot about climate alarmists and different kinds of deception and dishonesty. And if you're, you're trying to convince someone from scratch, that's not the way to do it. I don't think, but, I'm not someone who's encountering this from scratch. So when I read people, I'm just trying to focus on, okay, what, what can I learn from them? And this, this book in particular has a lot about the electric grid, uh, how important that is, how that works, and then some really interesting analysis of the costs of solar and wind, ener wind energy with his understanding of the grid as context. So first, first point that I've been thinking of a lot about a lot anyway but this this book has been helpful with is thinking about a broad question of what is energy availability? What is energy availability? Which I don't even think that's a term I've used in the moral case for fossil fuels, but it's a term I'm, I'm using a lot lately because I think it, it captures what we really need from our energy system, the system that produces and delivers energy uh, for us. So I think of energy availability as having four attributes. When I, when I say like there's a lot of energy availability in a country and the ordering of these might be interesting to you. So I have my, my, my attributes of energy availability are versatile, 
reliable, plentiful, cheap. So when energy is available, it is versatile, reliable, plentiful, cheap. Now, those of you who like the moral case for fossil fuels might notice, well, actually, you guys, did you guys notice any anything different about that order than I usually have? Well, traditionally, it's cheap, plentiful, reliable. And so the the emphasis is on the affordability issue. Yeah. And affordability is obviously really, really important because if you can't afford something, you don't have it. But cheap, plentiful, reliable, in my current thinking, it doesn't, there are cer- certain things that aren't quite captured. So I want to emphasize versatile, reliable, plentiful, cheap, and then why I'm currently thinking about it in that order. So number one is versatile. Now, at an abstract level, it's easy and can be useful to talk about energy in general, just as a general thing. So we have energy, which is the capacity to do work. And I'll often talk about it as energy is the ability to use machines to improve our lives. And that is fundamental. And I think it's a very, very important perspective. But at the same time, it's important that the way in which we use machines to improve our lives is is dramatically different. There are very dramatically different types of machines that require different uh, types of energy setups. And when we're talking in particular about potential substitutes for fossil fuels, it's very important to be aware of these because certain things substitute for some uses, but not others. So for example, here are some categories uh, of energy use that, and they're overlapping somewhat, but they're definitely not completely overlapping. So one would be electricity, one would be portable energy, one would be industrial energy, and then one would be heating. Now, uh, I should, so, you know, electricity, that's pretty self-evident that that generates electrical energy, which is this incredibly versatile type of energy, but then there's portable And one thing we've talked about a lot is that electricity is not, you can run it. I mean, if you can run it somewhere, then it's portable in that sense. But in terms of a mobile uh, application like transportation, there are all kinds of of cases like airplane flight and even farm equipment that has to go autonomously long distances and then uh, certainly going across the ocean where electricity it doesn't work very well because you don't have the right kind of storage system. And so then you're using petroleum or in the case of an aircraft carrier, you're using, uh, or a submarine, you know, you're using some sort of nuclear solution. And so, so those just, you can have something that can provide electricity, but it may not at all provide the portable energy. And then industrial, Stefan, what do you, what, what falls under industrial and why is industrial different than electricity? Because people might think of it as, oh, well, like, don't you just use electricity for everything? Well, it depends on the industrial process, but uh, so one important thing is uh, process heat. So a lot of industrial processes need uh, some kind of efficient heat energy. For example, uh, Canadian oil sands require a lot of steam. So you need need heat to create the steam on site. And, and that obviously is a different form of electricity. Now you can translate this if electricity is available to some extent, but it's usually not efficient. Yeah, and I want to jump on that point about it's not efficient. So the way electricity works most of the time is that what you're usually doing is you have some sort of heat engine. So like you have some fuel source, like whether it's uranium or coal or whatever, and then you're basically using that to generate a whole bunch of heat. This is oversimplified, but that creates pressure that moves a turbine that then can you know, using the Faraday effect can create electricity. And then what's happening then in terms of of the, what's called the heat content or raw energy of the thing is that you lose quite a bit of the raw energy in turning something into electricity. So if you just take natural gas, that would be the easiest thing. Like you might use natural gas to create electricity. And let's say if you had a really, really good setup, half of the raw energy would become electricity. Um, Okay. But then let's say you want to use that electricity to heat something up, like you want to have it heat the home. Well, then that electricity has to go over a transmission line, and then it has to power an electric motor that kind of does the thing in reverse that created the electricity in the first place. And then that'll have heating elements, and then that'll be like a space heater in your home. And sometimes people are aware that the space heater in their home is pretty expensive. Well, why is it expensive? Because it's generating heat by generating heat 
then turning that into electricity, then transmitting the electricity, and then turning that into heat. And what happens is a lot of the raw energy is lost. Whereas if you use natural gas heating directly, then you can sometimes capture 97% of the raw energy instead of what might end up being 33% of the energy. So in processes where it's very important to heat things, and as we're in the winter and in most places in the U.S., uh, this is something that's very close to home, you really want to be able to heat things efficiently. And so if you're if you're turning things into electricity and then into heat, that can end up costing a lot. And the same thing can be true for industrial processes where you need lots and lots of heat. You want to figure out an efficient way to do it. And so it's usually not use a bunch of heat to generate a bunch of electricity, losing a bunch of the initial heat, and then generating heat from there. And so this is why these are some reasons why we don't just use electricity for everything. We use these other forms of energy. Um, you know, we need portable energy. We need electricity. We need industrial energy. We need heating. And those, there, again, there's some overlap, but they end up being these very distinct categories because for those use cases, electricity is not always the thing that you want. So that's just one thing is when we're thinking about availability of energy, it means availability of energy for for every purpose. For, that's why I use versatile. So you need energy, you need a system that can give you uh, all, it had, that has the versatility to give you energy for all of the different use cases. So that's that's one of them. And then the next one, reliability. And this is where the book, Dumb Energy, I thought made some really good points. And in fact, these points were echoed in the book about Berkshire Hathaway, where Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are talking about energy, sometimes inaccurately, I think. But one one point that they made repeatedly, particularly as I, as I was looking through the reading, the history is really interesting because you get their commentary on different events. It was really interesting to see, oh, what, what were they saying about the California electricity crisis? And one point that they made that dumb energy made much more comprehensively is just how bad it is to have a blackout, how much it matters that your energy and in particular your electricity on the grid is available on demand. Because when that grid goes out for any significant amount of time, you're losing just billions and billions and billions of dollars. And this is where cost can confuse people because they can see, oh, well, this form of energy is slightly more expensive than this other form. And therefore, let's just use the cheaper form. But if the cheaper form compromises your reliability, then it's not really cheap because at some point it's going to, if it's contributing to grid instability, that is that is the kind of thing that should really, really scare us. You, you know, even an hour things going out, but let alone going out a day, two days, just so much relies uh, on a stable grid that it's it's almost scary. I mean, it's it's impressive. But it's it's scary just to think about, okay, what would happen if the grid went out for, for three days? And one, one final perspective on that is we're often taught to be afraid of climate instability by, or climate change, which is often thought of as instability. I don't think it is. But we're taught that, well, we have this fragile climate, this fragile ecosystem, and we need to be worried about any kind of destabilizing impact. But the real thing we need to be worried about destabilizing is the grid, because that is that is this very delicate mechanism that if it doesn't work, our our lives fall apart because it's it's such a good setup, but it's it's got a certain fragility to it. And thus we should be just be really much more mindful of any kind of energy proposal that threatens the stability of the grid. That should be viewed in the way that people view climate change as well. This is this is really this is a scary proposition. We should not be taking these kinds of risks. Uh so I find that really clarifying. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? Well, I mean, we can. There's a lot of points to make about the recent polar vortex, and uh, as somebody who caught the outskirts of it, I was very much appreciative of the reliability of heating and energy uh, last week. But one point that I think became really apparent is during this spell, where some parts of the United States were hitting like negative 45 degrees, um, 
solar and wind in many cases were producing nothing or virtually nothing. I think in in um, Minnesota, which hot, got some of the worst of the weather, it was producing 24% of its capacity, which means, you know, they've installed, uh, you know, a, a certain amount of solar and wind and you'll get headlines saying, oh, there's this much capacity. But what we can say, what we care about is its actual ability to provide us with energy. And it was only getting a quarter of its potential during this period. And so people were kept warm by mostly coal and, uh, and, and natural gas. And they kept the lights on because of coal, natural gas, and, and some nuclear. And the fact, the, the, Excel, which is the utility there, like they've announced that they want to be 100% non CO2 by 2050. And if you're concerned with, if you're thinking about grid stability, you'd think, wow, if we had been reliant on unreliable forms of energy during this cold spell, like millions of people would have had it really bad or even frozen to death. And that's kind of like just one really stark example of this issue of why we care about reliability. Yeah, I, I I can uh I haven't been experiencing this firsthand because I'm in Southern California, but yeah, just talking to different people, it's it's really scary to think about, wow, if your you know, if your furnace goes out, what that means. We often talk about people are just so worried about warming because that's that's the thing that fossil fuels plausibly contribute to and thus and, and thus human activity contributes to and thus people will tend to have fear and guilt about but in terms of the actual default climate situation of the world the thing to really be afraid about is cold cold is the thing that if you look at just around the world kind of if human beings are just naked without technology most places they're not going to just overheat in this terrible way but uh, most places, they will freeze to death pretty easily. And that's why if you look at, I've been looking lately at at energy usage statistics, and it's so dramatic how much of energy usage, particularly on a consumer level, is for home heating, even compared to air conditioning, even though heating is much, heating takes much less energy uh, just in terms of the way that it works than air conditioning. Air conditioning is much more energy intensive per unit of temperature change because Long story short, what you have to do, there's no, like, you can't really create cold. You can just push heat out of a situation, which takes a whole bunch of, of energy. And it's, it's, it's actually fairly simple to create heat. And yet we need so much of it, which is why it's such a large portion of use. And I just think of this kind of thing as I think about oh, people talking about, oh yeah, the grid is bad. Let's have a smart grid that can handle these unreliable things, or let's go hundred percent renewable, just really not thinking about the reality of climate for humans. Now, the, so I had versatile, reliable, and then plentiful and cheap. So I have plentiful next just because we need it to flourish. We need it in large quantities. And that that's important because it's not just that, oh, a little of it is cheap. We need a lot of it. So we need a lot of heat. We need a lot of electricity. We need a lot of jet fuel. And so it's just important when we're thinking about how the system works, it needs to give us, uh, it needs to be versatile, it needs to satisfy all these use cases, it needs to be on demand, reliable, and then it needs to be plentiful, available in large quantities. And then, of course, it needs to be cheap. We need to be able to afford it. Now, in that connection, dumb energy, and so by dumb energy, he's referring to solar energy and wind energy. He had some, um, Norman Rogers had some good analysis of the costs of these that were in many ways related to some topics. I think this was on the first new episode of Power Hour where I talked about Bill Gates versus Elon Musk, but I, I thought I'd share two, two uh, kind of calculations or models of calculation that I've been thinking about and that Norman Rogers certainly helped with. And one is how he measures the cost of solar and wind. And he has a I hope I'm not butchering this, but he has a. Here, here's at least how I am thinking of it, in connect it, as informed by what he wrote. So the way the way to think of it is, how much does a um, you know what is the you'll often think of okay what is the cost of solar energy or wind energy and and how do you calculate that? And the key insight that I totally agree with, but that he really uses in his calculations that I haven't seen others use in their calculations is is this. 
that if you want a system that has significant amount of intermittent energy, then what you need is you you need to pay the cost of both the intermittent infrastructure. So that's like the turbines, the construction, the transmission lines, land maintenance, et cetera. And you need to pay the cost of the reliable infrastructure. So this is the, the key point. If you want intermittent energy, you need to pay the cost of both the intermittent infrastructure and then the cost of the reliable infrastructure because the intermittent infrastructure needs life support. And because the need for life support is so fundamental and because the intermittent infrastructure can produce less than 5% of its theoretical capacity at any given time, you really have no replacement of the, 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 you need the entire reliable infrastructure that you would need anyway. So you really save nothing on infrastructure cost. In fact, you're, you're going to increase certain of the, in, in a sense, you're even increasing the cost of the reliable infrastructure. But if, if we put things like, so he has the example of for a certain kind of gas engine, if you're going to integrate it with solar and wind, you need to add this whole battery capacity to even allow the sub, the switching between one and the other. But let's just say you have the reliable infrastructure that would be perfectly capable of running, let's say, a country, and then you need the intermittent infrastructure on top of that. So that's one thing where you're always going to have that extra cost. And then the question is, what is the savings? And then his the, the basic way he puts it, which I think is right, is he says, well, the, then the only savings that you're going to have is the cost of your saved fuel. So when the when the um, solar panels are working and the wind turbines are working, you still have all of your reliable infrastructure cost, but you can save you save in fuel what you don't need to use. So if you say have natural gas at 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour and then the solar panels are running, then you don't need to use that fuel. So you've saved that, but you're still paying for all of this infrastructure and therefore, per unit of energy, solar and wind have these massive prices. So I thought that was a generally good way of thinking of it. But one point that he mentions kind of in passing that I think is much more important that I've mentioned on other episodes of this show is it's not just – you can't just look at the cost of saved fuel um, that because you also have to look at the cost of wasted fuel. And that's the cost of making the reliable energy – more uh, less efficient. So I've talked about how it's like stop and go traffic when you're trying to when you're trying to support erratic power with reliable power the reliable power becomes a lot less in a lot less efficient just like stop and go traffic is a lot less efficient than driving down the highway. So it's really you have to pay the cost of this amounts to the co- the added cost of the intermittent infrastructure you subtract the cost of saved fuel, but then you have to add the cost of wasted fuel. And then if you just compare that with the reliable system, you have no in- intermittent infrastructure. So you have the same infrastructure cost. And then you just have, you know, a fuel cost that's pretty small, particularly uh, when you discount the wasted fuel issue. So I thought that was just a good, the, the way people are accounting for these things is is really bogus. And we've talked about this before. So I thought it's just really good that he looks at the um that he just re- that he just treats the whole intermittent infrastructure as just a pure cost and then says okay the only thing that can that can save you money is the fuel and then and then even that you're not saving nearly as much as you think because you're using the reliable system has to use fuel less efficiently stefan do you have any thoughts on that yeah so i was thinking like even just letting this this capital sit idle, this reliable capacity sit idle, can incur costs. So if you think about a nuclear power plant, even if it's not in use, even if it's uh, you know sitting completely idle, not even stop and go traffic, even then both the fuel and the equipment will wear. So you still incur cost to this uh, capacity. It's not. You know, you're not pausing the cost calculation in that. So there's there's a lot of complexity in this, and it depends on you know what the reliable capacity actually is. But something like that has to be taken into account as well. Yeah, and so maybe infrastructure isn't quite the right term because it it might have the implication of being static. But I'm I'm just trying to separate it into because there's the fuel cost, and then there's everything else. And with solar and wind, all people want to talk about is the direct 
fuel cost and they don't want to talk about everything else. And yet whenever you're looking at those, you have to factor in the whole operational uh, cost, uh, including the, what I'm calling the infrastructure cost of the reliable system. So you're not, you're not getting rid of that. So you have to think of it as, you don't just think of it as, oh, I'm just running solar and nothing else. No, you, you are still, you still need to pay for the whole life support system because somebody is paying for that. So that's, that's one thing that I found useful is just how to cost, how to calculate the cost of unreliables or intermittent energy sources when you have a fuel-based backup net or life support. Then there's a question of, okay, how do you do it with batteries? And this, I was just thinking about this this morning and I got, I got a little bit intoxicated with making the calculations. Um, and I was thinking it's, it becomes really tricky to think about, well, how much does it cost? How much does the battery setup cost? Because it, it can be hard to think about, well, under different scenarios, how much would you be getting from batteries and whatever? So I, I tried to simplify it in this way and then using some stats from the, the book that I, I confirmed on the internet or on other places on the internet. And it was, I just asked this, okay, if we know that, if we know that with the unreliables that you can have periods of low energy for even up to a week, let's just say it's a really, if we're talking about how much batteries are needed, people will say, why can't we just store it? Just to give you a rough sense, a rough mental model of what it would mean to try to rely, like to have storage uh, the kind of storage you would need to provide life support to solar and wind. Here's just a thought experiment, which is what would one day's worth of global battery backup cost? So let's just say, in general, you if you're if you're running the, trying to run the whole world on solar and wind, you know, in general, on average, you would certainly like a day worth of battery capacity. Certainly, you'd like that for your home, you know, because you can just overall have patterns of lower sun and lower wind. And, so let's just say a day's, right? That doesn't sound like that much. Probably people would say, well, no, I'd really want a week, you know, just really to be safe. So, okay, so here here are the calculations, but just for a day. Now this is going to be, so I, I'd recommend, you know, you can do this for yourself there. And we're going to do it in terms of the terminology of kilowatt hours, in part because people are becoming more and more familiar with that because of the Tesla and the Powerwall and whatnot. So what you have with the, um, like a, uh, a new power wall is 13.5 kilowatt hours, about 14 and a half kilowatt hours. And the, when I was looking up the rate, th that is actually giving you a pretty good rate on batteries because the, the, like a good rate for batteries, according to McKinsey, as cited in this Norman Rogers book, is $200 a kilowatt hour. So, okay, $200 a kilowatt hour. Then there's a question of, okay, how much energy, how many kilowatt hours would you need for one day's worth of global global battery backup for all of our energy use, because people are talking about making it all 100% renewable, not just the existing electrical capacity. So here's here's the rough numbers. Uh, if you look on Wikipedia, you'll see we're at about 180,000 terawatt hours per year. Terawatt hours, so tera is what a trillion. Um, okay, so that that sounds like a lot. So let's divide that by basically 360, right? So that's 500 terawatts a day. So 500 terawatts a day. Now, how do we convert terawatts to kilowatt hours? Well, basically, not basically, exactly, a kilowatt hour, or a terawatt is 1 billion, a terawatt hour is 1 billion kilowatt hours. Okay. So if we have 500 terawatt hours a day of capacity in terms of kilowatt hours, then we have to multiply it by 1 billion. So that's going to be 500 billion kilowatt hours. Okay, so what's this is going to start to get big. What's 500 billion kilowatt hours a day times $200? That is $100 trillion a day. So for one day's worth of global battery backup, you pay $100 trillion a day. Now let's put this in context. How much wealth is produced in the world in a year? $80 trillion. Okay, so to have this battery system and let's say that might last 10 years, the, you would need just a day's worth. You would need a hundred trillion, which is 25% more than the entire world produces in a year. So that is a lot. And when, when people say, I mean, it's, I'm laughing, but it's just, th this is just comical when people are talking about oh yeah, why can't we do it with uh, batteries? There's just no sense of the scale of it. 
And here's the key. We, our whole energy system in the world takes advantage of the miracle of naturally stored energy, which is the fact that through natural processes, we have these batteries. They're not literal like human chemical batteries, but they're, they're effectively batteries. Like oil is a kind of battery. Gas is a kind of battery. Uranium certainly is a kind of battery. And what's happened is that natural forces have stored unbelievable amounts of energy for us. And then all we have to do is release it. But then what, if we try to reverse that and make our own version, it starts to become very expensive, particularly with lithium ion batteries, which are considered the best uh, solution. So this is seriously a hundred trillion dollars for a day's backup that will last you say uh, 10 years. Now I'm going to ask Stefan in a moment if he can, now I haven't run this by him. So if, if, if he catches me on something, then I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. But uh, here's my other calculation. If you just get a sense of uranium, like how much uranium would you need to give a, um, to give a day's worth of backup? So a kilogram of uranium gives you, now I've tried to do my homework here. There's not enriched uranium, so just raw uranium. So let's say that costs a kilogram of just uranium and then you need to process it to get it. But that'll give you just one kilogram of raw uranium, according to the U European Nuclear Commission, will give you 45,000 kilowatt hours uh, of energy, just, you know, just the uranium when you haven't refined it at all. And so I ran the numbers on this and this amounts to, to give you one day of backup, it costs you a billion dollars. So one thing using lithium ion batteries costs you $80 trillion and one thing costs you a billion dollars. Now, there are a lot of other things that you could involve here, but that, that gives you a sense of the scale. And that's why Bill Gates, to his credit, says this is insane when you're talking about, oh, we're going to back up the whole world with storage. You have no idea about the scale that you are uh, talking about. So, Stefan, I'm curious, can you, wh what do you think of my calculations? Uh, so, I I would have to see it in written form because uh, that makes it enables me to, you know, catch any calculation errors. Uh, so the thing about the uranium fuel, I would say, since the uranium fuel is more of a trivial cost in um, electric power from from nuclear technology right now, I would say that's that's probably an underestimate of the cost. But uh, so the other numbers look look really really good to me. Um, so one thing about the battery, uh, so you are calculating in just the storage capacity in terms of kilowatt hours. But one thing you have to think about is like, what, what's the cost influence of being able to discharge a large load? Because, you know, kilowatt hours is a measure of the storage capacity, but kilowatt is how much of the, of the energy you're getting out constantly. So there's that sort of two capacities if you think in terms of a of a hard drive for a computer uh, you have the storage like one terabyte of of data storage but then you also want to think about the speed like how quickly can i access this data this is also an important factor in you know battery cost probably so what what is your sense of how that of of how that works out i mean in terms of just it, it, would there be an issue just in discharging the amount of electricity at the rate needed? Yeah, just being able to discharge that this quickly, I think, will like increase the cost compared to like a standard lithium-ion uh, battery. And you also have to think about if you want to feed a large grid, this is not sufficient because a battery, you know, is good for small applications. But if you have to control like, and balance like grid frequency and, and voltage and so on, you also need uh, additional equipment to balance it out. Like what? With battery, it doesn't just simply work like like a coal power plant. So you need like flywheels or something like that that can, you know, in a very like millisecond, uh, um, like balance these these different metrics out. So I kind of had fun doing these calculations, but I also became annoyed because why are people making these calculations? There are all these energy economists and they're talking about these different things. And 
there's just so much bias in the system in favor of the unreliables that people just vaguely like to say, oh, yeah, they'll like they like to account for the cost of the solar in terms of, oh, solar panel costs are going down. But they're not just talking about, no, you need to account for the whole cost of the reliable energy system that your solar depends on. And you need to account for all of the fuel waste that your solar causes. And you can only really subtract uh, the, you know, any, any fuel savings you get, but that's pretty small amount of money. And that's why all of these systems that are adding solar, adding wind are having way more expensive electricity. Just, this is, this is not uh, to be cliche rocket science, but there's, there is just a catastrophic level of evasion. And then with the battery thing, just not people talk, they'll just give you all these graphs. Oh, batteries are growing. Gigafactories growing, but just not giving you a sense of, okay, what would it actually mean to back up the world for a day? Oh, it would mean more, it would mean completely like, you can't even talk about what it means to spend more money than the world produces in a year, like what what that um, amounts to. So uh, I hope that the, that people find this this clarifying in terms of, oh yeah, really understanding this point that the unreliables always have the cost of the reliable energy infrastructure and that the cost of batteries to back up even a day is just is insanely high. And maybe you can pass this along to people who just talk really u- loosely about replacing fossil fuels. The, the thing about fossil fuels in particular is that they're just so good at providing versatile, reliable, plentiful, cheap energy that it's just there, there's no concept of how much achievement has gone into that. And thus people are kind of, will readily think, oh, because I have negative associations for that with that, then it must be possible to do it with something else that I have positive associations with versus recognizing, no, whatever the challenge is involved in this thing, it is an amazing uh, achievement. And it is, it is providing this available energy that is fundamental to our entire material flourishing, which I would think of as primarily like the resources and capabilities that we have. In a sense, you can model material flourishing as it's kind of your resources plus your capabilities minus your risks. And those all go together because the resources and capabilities help you deal with the risks. But if you then think of what is the contribution of energy availability to that in terms of increasing your resources, increasing your capabilities and decreasing your risks, it's just so fundamental um, that it's it's almost impossible to to appreciate fully. 